Well, decades ago, a uh, friend and I decided to head out to the mountains of Southern California for a simple uh, three-day backpacking adventure. And it was February, so we knew we had to be prepared with layers and all things necessary for a wintertime outing. Excuse me, just fixing my mic here. Here we go. Our destination was Mount San Jacinto outside of Palm Springs. And San Jacinto Peak, which rises over 10,000 feet above the desert floor, is massive and appears so in part because it is one of the largest elevation gains over a small horizontal area and distance in the United States. It just appears massive. At the end of our first day hiking, we set up a base camp from which we could take day hikes around to explore. And then the morning of day two, we decided to hike up to the mountain peak. And by noon of the day of the hike to the mountain peak, the clouds began to thicken and the temperature dropped. And by three in the afternoon, we were in a full-blown blizzard. We immediately headed back down the trail, that is, until we lost sight of the trail. I'll spare the details, but it was bad. I remember saying something to my friend like, well, this really isn't very good, is it? I'm really not sure what we should do now. I don't even know exactly where we are. And I don't remember being in a situation like this ever before. Not good. Lack of clarity. Not knowing exactly what to do. Being in a brand new situation. Certainly, this is an apt description of where we are as a world right now. And it feels to me and others like we're in the midst of wilderness and Being in the wilderness is not always an easy place to be. One definition of a wilderness is a pathless area. A pathless area. And clearly the path we're on now as as humankind doesn't really even feel like like much of a path at all. Well, this week, like last, I feel compelled and must address what is happening worldwide during this crisis. And last week, I spoke about some things we need to keep in mind during this time and invite you to go to our webpage and you can check that sermon out. And today, I want to add to some of what I talked about last week, but from a bit of a different place. You see, stories about wilderness experiences are all over Scripture. And I think such stories are told not only because people lived through them, but because they have a lot to teach us whenever we find ourselves in a pathless area like today. Long ago, the people of God spent 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness. And sure, there were moments of clarity and direction But often the people were filled with angst and fear and anger and frustration, which often led to all kinds of dumb decisions. And it's to this wilderness experience of people so long ago to which I turn this morning because I find that there are great lessons we can take into our own wilderness experience right now. So let's look at some of these lessons. In chapter 16 of the book of Exodus, the people had been traveling for a while. Things were arduous, things were very hard, and the people, because things were not easy and because things were unclear, they began to complain about just about everything. They said, this is all wrong, this is bad, that's bad, this is not right, and on and on and on they complained. And needless to say, things snowballed in a bad direction, but God responded, From Exodus, we find this in adapted form. One morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as the frost on the ground. And the people looked around at each other and said, What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? And the phrase, what is it, is the word manna. And people, Moses replied to the people and said, it is bread that God has given us to eat. Gather as much as you need, but not more. And those who gathered much had nothing left over in the morning. And those who gathered little had no shortage. And God gave them manna each morning 
just as much as they needed. Well, as the story goes over time, some people tried to hoard manna, and God was not happy, and neither was Moses. And as we endure this worldwide crisis, as we live in this wilderness, is it not true, at least for many of us, that our basic needs are more than met? God provides, and we have what we need. Do we not all have those things we often take for granted? Do we not have food, water, shelter, loving people, great medical care, doctors, nurses, first responders, leaders, wonderful organizations to help, communities of faith? And I'd say that for many of us, our needs are more than met And just like God provided people with manna, is God not providing us with the manna we need right now, today, in this wilderness? Are we paying attention that we have the manna that we need? And is it also not true that some people are not seeing things through God's eyes, but instead are hoarding, taking, and gathering as much as they can in hell with the next person? And although this is the case, I believe God invites us today to spend our energy focusing on the manna that we have, not to spend our energy on complaining, not spending our energy on being critical of those who are taking far more than they need, not focusing on what is wrong and amiss, but rather to focus on the abundance that God is providing each one of us in this wilderness time day by day. Also in chapter 16, we find this. Moses in the wilderness reminds the people to take a Sabbath day, six days of work, one day of rest. The word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew word that means to stop, to cease. The Sabbath is to be a day we remember that this is God's world. God is our creator. God is the one who gives us life. God is the one who sustains life. And the Sabbath is to remind each one of us that we are utterly dependent upon God and everything belongs to God. And as one person notes, the Sabbath day is to be more than just a day of ceasing. It is to be a day of delight and joy. Why? Because everything and everyone is God's. And we need to purposely and regularly pause to remember such things. The Sabbath day, I believe, is a grace-filled reset button, if you will. Yes, we are invited by God to take a Sabbath day once a week. But I also understand that I, along with many of you, often don't take a Sabbath to the extent we need to. The Sabbath is not about getting things done. We don't have time to the rest of the week. It's to be a day when things cease and we joyfully remember God and our Creator and joyfully spend time with people we love. In some ways, as I've been thinking about this lesson from the wilderness, there is a blessing in this time. You see, in essence, many of us, if not all of us, have been forced into a time in which things have ceased. Much of what we normally do or activities we engage in have stopped. Things are canceled, closed. And perhaps we are invited to see this time in a new way. Perhaps we are invited to see this time as a Sabbath opportunity, a time to slow down, cease, reevaluate priorities, get off the treadmill, to allow ourselves and give ourselves the space and the time to feel joy over our Creator and people we love, to embrace this time of a forced pause and to explore what we might learn from this time when life resumes and goes back to normal, as it most assuredly will. Yes, things are hard. Yes, we are all losing money and income. Yes, we are inconvenienced. Yes, things are not normal. 
Yes, some people are getting sick. But in the midst of it all, what if we saw this time through the lens of a Sabbath? And what if we work to build new rhythms into our lives during this time we can take with us when we're out of this wilderness, as we will be? Then there's a great story in chapter 17 of the book of Exodus. The people again are in the mindset of complaining. Things are hard. Things are more difficult, and the people complain again. They also begin to question whether God is even around or exists. And when all of this happens, the people are in a place in the wilderness called Massah and Meribah. These words in Hebrew mean testing and quarreling. In God's response, God instructs, instructs Moses to strike a rock with a staff. And Moses does so, and crystal clear, pure, delicious water begins to flow out of the rock. And in this wilderness story, the people, again, not only spend energy complaining, but they invest energy in looking for signs of God's absence instead of God's presence. As I've thought about this and I've thought about the rough passages in my own life, I realize I've done the same things, complained and complained and complained and paid attention to evidence that God was not around or in my life. Such things did not leave me in a very good place. And like the people in the wilderness, I believe at this time that God invites us not only to not complain or to assume God's absence, but rather to invest all of that energy in seeing the clear workings of God all around us and in our lives. God is all over this worldwide crisis, if we will just open our eyes. Isn't it God's presence whenever love and care is expressed between people? Is it not God's presence that is turning people back to profound prayer? Is it not God's presence happening through good leadership, through medical care, through community response plans, through people figuring out how to creatively do things in brand new ways. Is that not God's movement in our lives? Is it not God's presence that has mobilized faith communities like Snowmass Chapel to care for people and even to worship through creative novel means? God's presence is everywhere, and God invites us to open our eyes and to see God acting. And whenever we witness anything that is loving, it is God acting, because God is love. Then there's this wilderness story in Exodus. The people have a ton of needs. Moses, an inspired fellow, has an independent, self-sufficient nature. The problem, Moses attempts to do everything without help. He begins to burn out as a result. That is, until he accepts some very good advice. That advice to rely and depend upon other people. What a great reminder during our wilderness experience. Perhaps now more than ever, we are reminded that we utterly need each other. We are reminded that we can get through no crisis on our own. We desperately need people. We desperately need to open ourselves up to the care and love of people, however that comes. This wilderness time, as it was for Moses, is a time to remember that we are called not to independence and independent living, but interdependence on others. We are to do for others, and we are to accept what others can do for us. The wilderness time is a blessed reminder that we are never to try and do life on our own, ever. We are made by God to be in relationship. I am who I am because of you, and you are who you are because of people around you. We need each other. What a great reminder during this time. So thus far I've talked about these things, remembering that God meets our basic needs day to day, that this forced time off can be a time to help us become more Sabbath-focused in our lives, that there's much around us to see God's presence and that we need each other. And with these things in mind, there are just a few more I want to briefly touch on from the wilderness. In chapter 20 of Exodus, Moses ascends Mount Sinai, and it's here that God reveals the Ten Commandments. 
commandments like you shall have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day, you shall not bear false witness. And certainly, the Ten Commandments are an entire sermon in and of themselves. But what I will say is that the Ten Commandments are all about our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. And it's important to remember that it is in the midst of a difficult wilderness setting that God reminds the people how to relate to God and how to relate to one another. In essence, the Ten Commandments are both boundaries and invitations. They are boundaries not to cross in an uncertain time. And they are an invitation to treat God and others with love as the foundation. And as we go through this wilderness time of our own, what a great reminder, when, when things feel crazy or out of hand or out of control, it is time to ground ourselves with the boundaries that God has given us, with the words of Scripture. It's time to ground ourselves in love. Our actions toward God and others are to be bathed in love, and this is perhaps the most fundamental thing to keep front and center in the midst of this crisis. Then, from the Exodus story, we encounter a central theme of Scripture, and that is justice. Here's how one person describes justice. Biblical justice involves making individuals, communities, and the cosmos whole by upholding goodness and impartiality. This is all about how we care for others, especially those living on the margins. Earlier, I mentioned that for many of us, God is giving us what we need day by day. But some people are in a position for all kinds of reasons in which they are in danger because their basic needs are out of reach. And this Exodus wilderness theme of justice is a clear reminder to us of the importance of justice during this crisis. That part of how we are call to respond in this crisis is to be aware of justice and to be intentional about doing what we can to help those who are desperate and on the margins. Certainly we are focused on caring for each of you at the chapel, but I am palpably aware as a community of faith that there are marginalized people up and down this valley as well. Recently the Aspen homeless shelter closed. People are in dire straits. I don't have time right now to get into the details, but we are going to respond, and we are going to help. And we need to help those, not only that are homeless, but those who are on other kinds of margins as well. Those who are feeling alone, or are struggling with depression, or anxiety, and mental illness. We are going to take some of our angst and worry, and use that as energy for justice for those who need it. And finally today, I want to close with something. It's from Psalm 95. It's interesting. It's the appointed psalm for the day at this time. It's a very interesting psalm in many ways. In the first part of the psalm, it's all about worshiping God and praising God. But in the final verses, there is reference made to Meribah, the Messiah. Remember, that's the place I talked about earlier, the place in the wilderness where the people complained and wondered if God was present. And it was there that Moses hit a rock and water came out. Interesting that the first part of the psalm is about praising God. And the last part of the psalm is a story about being in the wilderness. I wonder if this psalm is sending us a message in the midst of this crisis. A message to spend much energy praising and worshiping God in the midst of all of our feelings. Perhaps it's even a reminder to especially praise and worship God when we're in a wilderness, just as the psalm talks about. Here again are some excerpts from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. This is all about praising God 
in the midst of wilderness. Now, the word praise means a variety of things in Scripture. In fact, there are different words for praise in Scripture. The word praise can mean to rave about God with joy and thanksgiving, to extend our hands to God. To praise God means to bless God, to sing to God, to play instruments to God, to shout to God with a loud voice and to say hallelujah to God. That's what praise means. And Psalm 95 is a reminder to do those things in the midst of a wilderness. What a great reminder to us. We need to praise and worship God. And the more we praise and worship God, interesting things happen. When we praise and worship God, our focus shifts from ourselves to God. When we praise God, we remind ourselves that God is in charge. When we praise God, it's a reminder that fear and angst are needless. When we praise God, it can get our focus back to loving God, loving others, and loving ourselves. Praise is one antidote we need in the midst of this crisis. The last week I said we're far, far, far away from being helpless at this time. And again, I invite you to turn to that on our web page. But in addition to what I said last week, I invite us today to ponder our own wilderness crisis now in light of lessons learned from the wilderness of the experience of the people of God so long ago. And that is to remember with gratitude that God meets and provides for our daily needs. What more do we need? That it's a time to remember the Sabbath and to think about how we might incorporate Sabbath living when things return to normal. The God is all around us and there are many things through which we can see God working. That we desperately need each other and we're meant to be interdependent. The God through Scripture is given us boundaries to live within, which can give us stability in an uneven time, that we're to ground our lives in love, that we need to care for those having a hard time caring for themselves, and we need to praise, praise, and praise God in the midst of it all. My friends, God will get us through this time. All will be well when it's all said and done. We are not to fear. Jesus invites us to give him all of our burdens, and we're in this together with Jesus at our side. All astonishing blessings. And let us now pray.